that scout shall get Them that scout shall lose So the Bible says And it's still news Mama may have And Papa may have But God bless the child Who's got his own Who's got his own Yeah, the strong get more while the weak ones fade Empty pockets don't make the great Mama may have Papa may have But God bless the child Who's got his own Who's got his own of bread and such You can help yourself but don't take too much Mama may have and Papa may have but God bless the child who's got his own who's got his own child's got to have his own My name is Catherine Coyle and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. Unitarian Universalism is a big faith and we have a big message that there's one spirit of life that moves within and between us and calls us to care for each other. Our faith celebrates the beauty, diversity, and goodness of all creation, all life. We believe in love and compassion for all and in using our best learning to make the best choices we can. If you're interested in learning more about Unitarian Universalism or about our congregation, please visit us at uusv.org. I'd like to invite everybody to join us for the Zoom coffee hour immediately following the service. You can find the link to coffee hour in this week's current or on our website. Now let our service begin. Good morning, friends. I'm Lee Redding. I'm a member of the Sunday Service Associates. Our committee uh, recruits uh, and works with our guest speakers. Today, we are delighted to welcome back as our guest speakers, Christine Stay and Aidan Quinn. They will help us observe the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Christine and Aidan are known professionally as Friction Farm. I invite you to visit their website. Um, they perform original music full of harmony, humor, and hope. You are invited to sit back in the comfort and safety of your own home this morning and enjoy their service and song. Welcome, Friction Farm. Good morning. This morning's chalice lighting words are from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Sometimes I'm right, 
Now is the time in our service when you are invited to share your hopes and joys as well as your concerns and sorrows as we roll into a new year. This poem is written by the elders of the Hopi Nation. It's called, This is the Hour. We have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Where is your garden? It is time to speak your truth, create your community, be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be the time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on <clears throat> to the shore. They will feel that they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. The elders say we must let go of the shore and push off and jump into the middle of the river keep our eyes open and our heads above water. See who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. 
all that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and celebration. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you for sharing your heart and allowing us to stay connected in this virtual world we're living in. For everyone, please find comfort in knowing that we care for you and hold you up with our loving thoughts and prayers. Our reading is a poem from Langston Hughes, written in 1936. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Now let there be an offering to sustain and strengthen our little congregation, which is special and sacred to so many of us a community of action and connection and hope, for we are the keepers of the dream. We thank you for your financial support and good energy. He 
green. My dad is American. Born here to parents born here. Raised here. An army veteran. He's a true blue American. My mom is an immigrant from Japan. She's yellow. Yellow and blue make green. Green is symbolic of nature, of renewal, but it's also the color of aliens. Can you see me? I'm white, usually. But sometimes around people so white they glow, I stand out. When I smile really big, I can look Japanese. Sometimes the things in my lunchbox are alien. <laughs> And when I have a good tan, people often ask where I'm from. In the words of the great philosopher Kermit the Frog, <clears throat> it's not easy being green. Kermit says that being green, it seems you blend in with ordinary things. Well, there were many, many days when I wished I blended in. When I was four, we moved to Woodstock, New York. A man knocked on our door. He hesitated, looked me over for a second, and then asked if my mom was home. He was an older Japanese man, and I guess he was some sort of welcoming committee, or maybe he was doing reconnaissance for the other Japanese people in our area. My mom was born and raised in Japan. She was already a U.S. citizen by the time we got to Woodstock, but we had been out of the country for a few years and were just coming back. <clears throat> Eventually, that man brought over a list of names and phone numbers of other Japanese women in our town and nearby towns. That's how I learned she was an immigrant. That's how I learned she wasn't white didn't really seem to matter, but I found out that it mattered to some people, men of a certain age in particular. I didn't know about World War II then. I just thought old men were grumpy. Some women too. When my mom spoke with her heavy accent, some people got nervous. Some people got uncomfortable, some were dismissive, and some were mean. Once we were in a store looking at a washing machine and the salesperson wouldn't talk to my mother. He kept trying to talk to me. And I was a kid still in grade school. We didn't buy a washing machine. And another time, my mom uh, backed the car into another car in a parking lot. And that's when I learned about you people and why you people should go back to where you came from. But I digress. Back to the women on the list. They became my mom's friends and our family friends. Most of them were married to American-born men. Like, like us, they were mostly lower middle class. And I knew their kids. And somehow, the parents, the in-laws, the cousins, we had all gotten over it. Yellow and blue had combined, period. I was with my uh, friend Donna at a playground, and a couple of older girls we didn't know came by, and they asked where she was from. And Donna didn't really know what they were asking, and she said the name of our neighborhood. 
but that's not what they were after. They asked where her parents were from, and she honestly answered, Canada, which confused them, and eventually they went away. I knew what they were asking. They saw something in her. Donna's mom is Native American, and what they saw was something different, maybe something they could use, maybe a weakness. And that day I got to explain to Donna that sometimes she would be green. After the sixth grade, a new girl moved into the neighborhood. And she was a couple of months older than me, and she was beautiful. She had a brand new bike. I really couldn't believe that she wanted to be friends with me. Her family was Persian. She saw something different in me too. But that was a good thing. A possible ally. Someone who would be more understanding, more accepting. And she was right. All the customs, the habits, the foods, the accents, they all seemed normal to me. We had the best summer. And then we started junior high. And girls that age can be so tough. We were not. It was easier on me. I don't look exotic. I'm not brown. I can blend in. So I did. And I tried to be a good friend, but I just didn't know how. Eleanor McHenry lived on my block. Sat in the same class, and we lied. School, we'd race home really fast. Pick out our favorite games. Well, Eleanor always chose last. She was the best friend I ever had. Best friend I ever had. That's saying a lot. said she was smart but just didn't apply I wrote for the paper and I went out for track Ellie made new friends she never looked back was the best friend I ever had best friend I ever had and that's saying a lot very white. 
until I took the PSAT and encountered the boxes. You know those boxes where you're supposed to check one? White, Hispanic, Asian, other? Which box? Could I fill in two? Would that be wrong? I didn't know, so I left it blank, and I didn't talk about it. But by the time college applications came around, I was ready to talk about it. Which box can I fill in two? Was I betraying one race if I filled in one and not the other? My parents were pragmatic. Will either box get you more financial aid? No? Well, then who cares? And throughout my childhood, that's the way we dealt with it. Mom looks foreign, speaks with an accent, and assumes some people are prejudiced against her because of that. And my dad, he just kind of floats above it. They get on with their lives. And that seems kind of strong and noble, doesn't it? But it isn't. Racism changed their lives and how they lived their lives, but my parents didn't acknowledge that. And that affected me. And it affects you. James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed if it isn't faced. Despite my own firsthand experience, I didn't know how to be an adequate friend to a brown girl. I wanted to, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know how to check a damn box. I needed tools, words, actions, psychology, knowledge, history. I needed to know why people treated each other differently. That sometimes it was unintentional, but that was still wrong. I needed to understand the consequences of poverty, of oppression, of fear. I knew I shouldn't feel less than or other, but sometimes I still did feel that way. I knew that I should never treat anyone else as less than or other. And yet sometimes I did that, even though I knew how it felt. My mom, she just needed me to be white and American. And she still does. So remember those Japanese women that became my mom's friends? Well, they were mostly married to American-born men, mostly white, mostly. And they were mostly lower middle class, like us. But one of the dads was Hispanic and the kids were all brown. And my mom made it clear that somehow they were beneath us. She was kind and she was subtle, but the message was clear. Look, looking back, I realized she needed somebody to be beneath her. I realized she needed to be above someone. She needed somebody to make our family look average, all American, and white. There's an entire industry, policy, hierarchy, that works hard to make her feel that way. Outside forces focus her attention on comparing herself and me to all of the other aliens, other colors, others. 
Toni Morrison said during a talk at Portland University, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over your reason for being. There's a part of racism that is the opposite of what we usually think it is. It, it's not about our feelings towards someone else, whether tied to their color or ethnicity or not. It isn't about their inadequacy, their behavioral traits, their genetics. It's about ours. It's about inventing a new rung on the ladder so that you're not at the bottom. Because there isn't any other way up. We, we create another layer. A layer of hierarchy over someone who is newer to the country or less white. Because we have no other way up. And there's a system in place that fosters all of those feelings of inadequacy and desperation and marries them to fear to produce racism and discrimination. It's a system of abuse, and we pass along that discrimination just like children of abuse. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-centered society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, then the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. I share my family stories with you, not to blame my mom or myself or anyone who finds themselves on the bottom rung. Mom didn't have the tools of change. So she passed along not an overt racial bias, but rather an acceptance of a system that is racist the system that requires her to prove her worth in provenance or wealth, while simultaneously making sure she can never attain those. And despite experiencing and witnessing the pain of that system, I still embraced what she passed down. But what I learned from being green is that it's easier to pretend to be white instead of green. So imagine how easy it is if you don't have to pretend and if you think that your whiteness is all the value you have. To break that cycle, we don't start by changing how we see others. We start by changing how we see ourselves. And that's really, really hard. Your father and my father both fought in the war. They came from different tribes. They came from different shores. They believed in God and country family and pride they swore they would protect us from the other side from the other side your father and my father had stories they could tell about the burden of a soldier to survive a living hell 
After what they've seen and what they've done, they both feel justified to swear they will protect us from the other side. From the other side. From generation to generation, we're told how it was when fear found evil in good and decent men. We are living in a world of wealth and wisdom, wonders without end. If we can't make peace now, then when? Your father and my father worked hard and they made plans Someday everything they dreamed would be trusted to our hands Let's honor and respect them, swear upon our lives We will never ever be each other's other side, other side Each other's other side We will never ever be each other's other side We will never ever be each other's other side We will never ever be each other's other side So last week Georgia elected its first black senator and its first Jewish senator. Also last week, people stormed the Capitol wearing t-shirts that said Auschwitz. Both of those things are America. Both of those things were groups gathering together to express their vision of America. I would bet everything I have that one of those groups feels a lot better about themselves than the other. We extinguish our chalice and count on you to carry the flame of love with you and out into the world. Of the plan for 
every thug who guards the gate with a raised clenched fist there will always be men who coexist there will always be there will always be Misguided spark falls on tinder to ignite A raging fire growing much too big to fight Malicious mobs may tattoo numbers onto wrists There will always be angels in our midst There will always be There will always be Be.